Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Green Mountain Care Board. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, some reminders and some scheduling updates. Uh, reminder that we have an open public comment period in place from May 13th until July 24th, 2019 for the 2020 Vermont Health Connect uh, exchange filings. And as a preview to our July schedule, which is posted on our website online, I want to announce that on July 3rd, we will not be having a board member, a board meeting. We have all of our board members here um, in, in light of uh, Independence Day. And then also, um, it's a busy, busy month for July. Um, we have a uh, primary, in, in addition to our regular, regularly scheduled board meetings, we have a primary care advisory group on Wednesday, July 17th. That's, uh, that takes place at our offices at 144 State Street, open to the public, uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. And then on Tuesday, July 23rd, we have the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, rate review hearing at, starting at 8 a.m., and that's in room 11 at the State House. And then on July 23rd, we have MVP, oh, sorry, let me back up. We have MVP on the 22nd, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield on the 23rd, and then the night of the 23rd, starting at 4.30 to 6.30, we're going to have a rate review public comment form, and that will be held in the council chamber, chambers at Memorial Room at C City Hall in Montpelier. And then on the 24th, we do not have a board meeting. So those are the updates. Please consult our website where all of our meetings are posted. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 12th. Is there a motion? It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 12th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So at this point, uh, we're going to invite Dr. Brumstead to come down and uh, um, really just give us a, an update on how things are going um, at this point in the year. And, uh, we welcome you, John. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the opportunity. Um, and uh, uh, it is, I think, an opportunity just to check in. Uh, we'll be back together again at your invitation, I think later in August, uh, to talk about uh, the specifics of our, uh, of our budget. Um, I'm going to um, uh, keep this pretty high level, although I do have some uh, financial uh, information that uh, I'll be presenting um, uh, and really can, it, however you want to uh, handle this, be conversational, uh, which is what I'd, uh, I'd really appreciate. Um, so I'll encourage the board members if you have questions on any particular slide just to jump in at that time. Sure. And go back to it. I really would appreciate, you know, I want to be very open with the financial slides, but I'd really like to get past the financial check-in to the other parts of the uh, conversation. If we do end up with a non-CEO level deep dive. I do have our secret weapon, Professor Stanislaus, in the, uh, in the audience. So Mark, stay awake um, uh, to, uh, to come down. You know, I really want to thank you for um, your approach to uh, trying to understand what's going on out there in the broader uh, healthcare environment particularly in rural health care. Um, you had a great panel. Uh, it was nice to hear the uh, gentleman, uh, the pundit from Stroudwater talk about a lot of the things that we believe and we've been trying to implement over the past 
uh, five or six years. And there's just no question that there are uh, storm clouds on the horizon, particularly as it relates to delivering healthcare and maintaining access in rural environments. The uh, economics and the financial models based on uh, the, the prior approach are, are pretty dismal uh, to do that. But we actually see a clear road ahead and what we're really all about is preserving access to high quality care in our region. And we believe that we can do that using the existing backbone of our regional delivery system. That we don't need to bring in new players, the business disruptors, uh, you know, kill me if people are getting their primary care at Walmart. Um, you know, what we really need to do is on the backbone of the delivery system that people in our region have depended on, have trusted, have gone to for decades and decades. We believe that we can bring <clears throat> those organizations, those providers, those communities together and preserve that access to healthcare services that's critical. But we also know that we're going to have to be innovative in doing that. Some of the innovations that you heard from the Stroudwater uh, folks uh, were uh, really uh, all about doing the hard work of really integrating the care and changing sort of what's being done where and um, uh, putting intentionality into how services uh, are distributed and really shift more towards a wellness approach um, while still providing the sick care that everybody needs. And, you know, you've heard me talk about connecting that to um, the reimbursement models that we've been, uh, I hope you um, uh, agree, have been 150% in on as we've gone down that path. And for our leadership teams, um, anything that we're going to invest in, uh, in dollars or human resources or uh, energy uh, or engaging uh, others to understand, really are going to be run through a filter on the impact that those uh, uh, investments would uh, make uh, for our patients and our families, the impact it would have on our communities, and particularly, and I'll come back around and talk about workforce, the impact that um, the size and scope of our initiatives, the pacing of our initiatives have on our people. So our patients and families, our communities, uh, and our people is really sort of um, anything we're going to do, we're going to uh, judge the impact uh, in those areas. And so um, we, as a leadership team, feel that um, really, the uh, more granular approach to uh, our road ahead is to really maximize the clinical, operational, and financial performance of each one of our units. So we can't just sort of hide that local performance behind a cloud of we're a network now. Um, we really need to make progress on shared administrative services. Believe it or not, those administrative services are only 12.7% of the cost structure of our broad network. But, you know, there is um, uh, perception beef in going there because it really shows that we can, as a network, collaborate and share. You've heard me say I, I view um, one care, you know, one step removed as a shared service among all providers, that we really need to focus on the provision of high value care, quality, cost, um, uh, outcomes. And the other place that, you know, many, many evolving integrated delivery systems haven't gone is looking at ways uh, uh, with great innovation that we can look across our organizations and see if there are ways to integrate services that you wouldn't think of. Why 
with our seven hospitals do we have seven um, uh, pharmacies and depending upon how you count it between seven and ten different formularies so that's an area uh, as well that we're really going to work on so we see a road ahead we've sort of defined the lens through which we look at big time projects and we have some general areas that as we drop down to a granular level we're focusing all of our teams and all of our organizations around. So uh, I'll jump into this. I realize it's small, but you have this, uh, I'm assuming right in front of you, you all have this so you can see the numbers. Uh, first thing, um, uh, the uh, green <laughs> to the right is team projected. I just want to emphasize projected. This is uh, through April performance, we just got uh, May, it really doesn't change much. Um, and this is annualized with some seasonality and with the CFOs of each one of our organizations taking uh, uh, a look at uh, this. But it's a projection and you almost certainly will see different numbers when the year is, is actually closed. Um, I go down to um, uh, about a third or half way down total net patient service revenue, um, fixed prospective payment and one care revenue. And um, uh, we believe that when we finish the year on the revenue side, uh, we'll be about 1.4% over. And I'll come back to that. And this is, this spreadsheet is for the University of Vermont Health Network, Vermont Hospital. So, Medical Center in Burlington, Porter, uh, and Central Vermont. And um, uh, I would um, take a moment to emphasize that I believe going forward, more and more, you all are going to have to regulate the University of Vermont Health Network, at least at the Vermont level, and not at the individual um, entity level. I realize that causes some change and some difficulty, but you heard the gentleman from Stroudwater talk about the value that comes from these entities coming together. And the value that we create there is by functioning not as individual three hospitals with their providers, but in the collective figuring that out. So having each one of the organizations hit the same common metrics, uh, I think uh, is difficulty and that we're not getting the value out of that collaboration and that affiliation uh, coming together in that, uh, in that context. The other thing that sort of jumps out to me, if you go uh, above in the uh, 2019 uh, uh, variance amount, there's the fixed prospective payments are 67 million dollars off. And that's really because when we budgeted, we believed that Blue Cross Blue Shield would be providing fixed prospective payments uh, in 2019. And we didn't quite get there. We do believe we'll get there in 2020. But so the fixed prospective payments are that much light because uh, uh, that's uh, in the fee-for-service uh, bucket. And on the expense side, um, uh, we uh, do have total salaries that have risen. I'll show you the medical center in a minute. Um, and the total non-salary expenses, some of that is volume related, seeing more patients. Again, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but also the 340B in the pharmacy and other pharmaceutical expenses uh, are part of that close to uh, 5%. <coughs> Uh, growth. So, um, uh, take away from this slide, revenue slightly ahead, expenses over, and so um, uh, it's um, uh, going to be tight. Uh, we'd like to think that we're going to uh, make the projected margin, but um, uh, I think this is going to be a tough year. And as an aside, um, we told all the rating agencies that going into 19, 20, and 21, 18 through 21, our margins were going to be stressed because of the investments that we've made and that we had a great plan to 
come back out of that, and cash would stay strong. Even with that, Moody's, based on our 18 performance, was um, chopping at the bit to give us a, a negative outlook. So we're very focused on, uh, uh, on our margin uh, for, for 19. I'm just one question on that. Um, on the other revenue <coughs> line that's up 32 million, is that for the 340D and there's a lot of expenses below that are offsetting that? That's uh, exactly. Uh, that's the 340B. And I have a slide in a little bit. You know, just like a huge chunk of not for profit healthcare in this country right now, um, uh, but for the um, 340B program, it would be very, very little margin anywhere to be reinvesting in people programs. Uh, so that's exactly what that uh, what that is. Um, did I switch this? So at the uh, medical center, um, uh, really that's uh, uh, again the driver for our network. Um, uh, you can see that uh, same thing with the fixed prospective payment being light. And we think on the revenue side, uh, and again I'll get to this, 1.9% um, uh, greater than uh, the original budget. And um, that, um, again, the dominance of other revenue, close to $30 million, uh, um, and greater than budget, we've had people because this is, you know, uh, one of the areas uh, that there is uh, funding available. We've gone after that uh, significantly. And then you go down in the total salaries, and for the medical center, uh, this is related to the organized uh, labor activity in our contracts. Um, we're uh, chugging along above what we ordinarily would consider uh, inflation, although I challenge that going forward. I think the salary, the workforce inflation is going to be significantly higher than 3% in healthcare, but 4.1%. Um, uh, and again, the folks at the uh, medical center, because they want to close the door, would be great. Um, uh, at the medical center, the team uh, believes that there's a chance of hitting the, the margin target. May uh, was uh, another uh, couple million dollars off of budget, made money but off of budget. Uh, so if we added that in, it makes the uh, hill in the last quarter of the year uh, a little bit steeper to climb. We'll just have to see, uh, see where we end up uh, with the dynamics of that. So, um, uh, I understand that. Uh, Do you see the long term uh, growth in that uh, wage inflation to be? Um, I'm certainly not an expert, but I expect it to be 30 to 50 percent above what the rest of inflation is running at. I just think we've got nationally some catch up to do um, in you know all of those wages being uh, suppressed for so long. And then you put on top of that health care uh, with the aging population and the demands on uh, the numbers of people being trained. And you put, you know, that we're in a rural environment and, you know, we some consider us a, to be at the end of a long winding road. Um, and it's not like recruiting in Boston or uh, one of those other urban environments. So I think we're really going to have to uh, invest appropriately significantly in our workforce. And um, I'll show you uh, some programs towards the end that uh, I think we have to increasingly grow our own and find very innovative ways to bring people into the healthcare workforce uh, uh, and, and support them. And I understand that, you know, uh, if 19 ends up where we think it is that the uh, revenue piece uh, collectively will be uh, above uh, what uh, we budgeted and your uh, 50 basis points of leeway. Um, I would uh, bring forward that we're continuing to see in migration 
to our primary service area while the Vermont uh, population remains relatively stagnant. The uh, top bars that are all moving to the right um, are our primary catchment area. Um, this is just a, a linear representation and pulling out just our UVM Medical Center, so I switched over to the Medical Center at this point. Our primary market, the population growth. And my favorite, since I'm right in there at this point, the percent of change in the population over 65, you'll note that uh, even Chittenden County down at the bottom, that uh, over this time period, um, 3% change in the population over 65, while Chittenden County is the, um, uh, I guess you'd say, beneficiary of in-migration from around the state with uh, some of the, uh, the young folks. So we're really seeing that we're having uh, growth in revenues. Unfortunately, the growth in expenses are currently over and above that, which, believe me, we're very, very focused on. Um, and we're seeing age of the population, which would come out in case mix index or the acuity of the services that we're providing. And so uh, another point, you know, look at us as a constellation of organizations in Vermont. Another point just to emphasize is that we really need to collectively work on getting to a population-based metric. So this is um, CMI adjusted, so it adjusts for uh, the acuity of the cases, the demographics, um, with uh, the revenue sources per unique patient. And our finance folks, uh, led by uh, are really, really smart people, have had and will continue to have conversations with the really, really smart staff people on the Green Mountain Care Board to make sure that um, we're sharing the methodology with which we would define unique patients. And you certainly could do this cost per unique patient. It would be essentially uh, the, the same uh, in this case. But if you look at the uh, patient service revenue over years, if you don't put the uh, population shifts and the demographics in, thank you very much for the discussion on rebasing last year, you miss the story. You know, what uh, I'm uh, laying out there for our teams as far as our targets are the cost per adjusted or per, um, uh, per uh, unit of service um, in a whole bunch of different ways. And we're watching the revenue growth that uh, adjusted for acuity and um, uh, in the population that we're serving. More people are coming. We're not going to turn them away. They're more acute. They need more services because they're older. So this, or if we go back and forth and there's a better way to normalize on a per capita basis, uh, we're all ears. But this is, you know, you can see the year over year growth well within uh, what we're trying to do with the all payer model when you do adjust. And in 19, uh, even though the uh, uh, revenue looks like it went up one point, uh, four or 1.9 percent, um, it's really not uh, uh, going up on a, a per capita basis. I have a question about um, the, this slide. And is when you're obviously for your patients, you're going to be getting a bunch of folks from New York and your New York hospitals transferring folks. So uh, I assume that this includes. Uh, every patient regardless of residency, is that? Yes, this is every patient, but just for the UVM Medical Center. Okay. And um, that's still New York patients on this book of business still are 
uh, ticking along in the 15 to 18 percent range. I'll give it a thumbs up. So it, it's a clearly a factor because those people are coming for tertiary quaternary care, so they'll right. bump the CMI up uh, and maybe the cost up it would drive this in the, in the other direction. So another um, uh, uh, important Um, another important um, uh, finding, and um, I'm honestly not lobbying here. I can do that really, really well. I'm just explaining our uh, internal thought processes. And, you know, just to be really simplistic, um, uh, if, and this is way simplistic, so Mark, plug your ears right now. But, you know, I just look at inflation, 3%. Commercial business is um, about half of our business at the medical center. To cover inflation, since we ain't getting nothing from uh, Medicare or Medicaid, um, we need about a 6% going in. Okay? You fine tune that and you go up and down. But um, if you look across the top, um, the commercial rate increases that we've had, and then just uh, calculate the value of a 1% uh, increase, the difference between what we would get at 6% and what we actually got is that third row down. So in, uh, in 19, it was $20 million was that uh, difference. And you know where we're making that up is based on to a significant degree, the 340B program. We're making that up some on that volume that's generating the revenue. But my concern is the bottom line that we're doing everything we can. And believe me, I've got the throttle down all the way on expense control, and we continue to work on that. But my concern is that um, with below inflation commercial rates. Our margins, particularly with the stress on the investments that we're making, are slipping. And so we're watching that carefully. We have to um, push on the expense. We have to maximize uh, uh, 340B. Um, you know, honestly, I don't know the specific number that we put into the um, the, the budget filing. Uh, you'll find out from our narrative uh, in uh, 10 days. But um, this is something that we all have to pay attention to, and you know, um, we just have to be very thoughtful, I believe. Um, um, how we pour money uh, into the system at this point, being appropriately frugal, but also uh, not blind to the ramifications. So, can I make a comment on that? Because I think sure. there are also ramifications for commercial increases that begin to price Vermont families out of the commercial insurance market, which is quite frankly a fear that I have that over time what we're going to see because of these dynamics that you were just talking about is that uh, our uninsured rate is going to go up because people can't buy insurance which then <laughs> flows back to you all that's where uninsured folks go is to the hospital because they can get coverage so I think I, you know it's it's a tough market dynamic in a small rural state where the median family income is less than 60,000. So I think, you know, I don't have an answer, obviously. It's just another part of the market dynamic. I couldn't, uh, couldn't agree more. I think um, on uh, the 30 or 35,000 folks that are on the uh, exchange, um, depending, you know, that there's obviously a sliding scale on subsidies for those folks. And I think that the uh, real answer in my mind, is in the all-payer model. Bring those folks into a, uh, even those that are self-insured, and I'll come back to this because I think there's some progress there, into the model 
where the providers are taking accountability for the utilization, taking the utilization risk, and that the, the dollars, if that risk is appropriately managed, um, at least partially accrue to the delivery system, those providing the, the care. And so we can talk more about that, but I, I agree. This is very difficult, and this, um, the pricing of traditional uh, uh, healthcare insurance uh, in a small market like Vermont um, is difficult, bordering on impossible. And I would, I would just uh, piggyback onto that, that uh, the real need to try to keep pushing, even though we all believe that the all-payer model is the answer, uh, Medicaid and other government programs should not be given a pass as to their obligations in the system. And, you know, what your chart very simply illustrates is the need that in your particular case, the commercial rate increase has to be double the inflation rate, but then you look at other areas of the state that have half as much commercial insurance as what you have, and then you started to look at uh, four times what the inflation rate is, and, and that's just obscene. And so I, I know you're not wearing your lobbying hat today, but I just would say that nobody should be giving government a pass. And I guess I'll recognize two legislators since they're here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Representative Lori Houghton and uh, Representative Carol Odie. Um, but we can't just keep pushing it out of the commercial. And that's the point I would make. Yeah, I, you know, you're not going to get an argument from me, Chair Allen, on the cost shift. But there are some realities and you know this really the point of this is how we the levers that we have to pull yep. to close this gap whatever the genesis of it is if it's not commercial rates it's 340b it's um, expense control and reduction um, and you know if we can't pull those levers fast enough or dramatically enough um, without interfering with access to services, we end up with uh, erosion of the margin, which, as you all know, we need to uh, reinvest with. Yeah, that would be said. I think you just touched on it. I mean, when I looked at this chart, I wrote a couple things that could be added to it, because I imagine we're going to probably see it at budget time. And one of them was expense control and efficiencies, because, um, you know, we continue to push on where is there waste in the system and how do we get that out. And the other would be, it's kind of the offset of, because you're saying more people are moving into this area, into the Chittenden County area, and you get more patients, there should be some fixed leverage on the cost, too. So, I mean, you know, when we're exceeding the top line, we would hope there would be some leverage on the fixed costs. It's not all, you know, variable. But, you know, I appreciate how you're looking at this. I would have just added, you know, I think when we look at it at budget time, the other pressures would be what cost saving initiatives are helping to offset those inflationary drivers. And if we're getting more patients, how are we leveraging? Because you talked about across the, looking at you as across the system, partially because you can get synergy. So. Um, uh, couldn't, uh, could not agree more. And for those kind of inappropriate to say what I say to our management team, the speech that you just give, gave, I've given to our management team on about a weekly basis for the past 18 months. So, But it, it's, it, it, I can't overemphasize the difficulty of, and the grinding of gears when you get to a point where it's not just going to your book of what the top uh, decile um, unit of service costs are for all the cost centers in an academic medical center, which we do, and you sort of maximize all of that, and then you go, okay, where do we go now if it's not uh, to just ratchet back on the services we're provided? And, you know, I believe strongly that there is the savings and efficiency in the actual way we're delivering care you know, replicate and duplicate only where absolutely necessary 
and make sure that you get it right the first time, every time. And um, what I alluded to before, I mean, taking a freestanding hospital, bringing it into an affiliation, and saying, oh, by the way, you're not going to have your own pharmacy anymore. We're going to have this sort of nice coalesced pharmacy. It's a, I'm not making excuses of being defensive. It's what I, we are driving towards. It's just, it's a race against uh, a lot of the, the rest of this. The easy stuff, I believe, um, long ago was captured. And it's a driver for doing this. It's a driver to have a global um, fixed payment as a real incentive for uh, everybody inside of our tent and elsewhere to be driving towards those difficult to get uh, efficiencies. So um, here's a happy story that um, I hope we can all revel in. I think it was um, uh, summer, fall of 14 when we uh, came to you all to get a uh, certificate of need, you know, about $200 million to uh, move towards um, single occupancy rooms at our state's academic medical center. Um, and that was on a backdrop of a new regulatory uh, process and environment, uh, lack of trust based on the prior huge uh, building project that had gone uh, significantly sideways. So we appreciated the sort of the tension and the back and forth and the approval with the caveats, um, but we're there now. And this is um, an unbelievable resource for this region. So Saturday, June 1st, um, uh, we moved uh, close to 100 patients out of their double rooms uh, into the Miller building, uh, named after Bob and Holly Miller, who were significant uh, donors to this project, and this uh, patient is the first patient that moved uh, into uh, the, uh, the Miller building. So, um, just as the move went uh, along and our staff had tirelessly for several months practiced how all this would go, each patient greeted, um, uh, essentially uh, plugged into uh, the new room. You can see that this is the uh, patient and provider uh, section uh, of the room and the technology. Each one of these beds uh, is uh, telemonitored so we can expand up or down the acuity. They essentially all could be ICU beds, uh, although they're certainly uh, not uh, used that way uh, at this point. And um, uh, you see in the background is um, something that uh, I just can't tell you what it's done to the healing environment uh, just in these uh, few days. To have towards the window not only the light uh, and the beauty of uh, our environment, but you see a bed and a chair, and that's the family space. So the family can be with their loved one when they're uh, as they're recovering, and that couch there is fold out. So spouse, child, loved one can spend uh, the time uh, with, uh, with the patient as they recover. And you can tell this uh, nurse is pretty darn happy. Um, and, you know, uh, there is high tech uh, in these rooms. That little iPad uh, very much controls uh, the environment and the uh, patient or family really can do that all the way from, you know, getting Netflix and plugging into their Netflix account to more uh, important things like educational uh, uh, 
information or even finding out the test results that go into my chart uh, yeah, through this. Um, and again, that's a, a, a real uh, crowd pleaser. Um, uh, just um, from a patient, I was doing my infusions in Boston. The care was great, but no better than here. This is home. Uh, another patient, uh, I used to have a little slice of the sky, but now I have this view. Wow, this is amazing, incredible. Um, uh, this from uh, a patient uh, uh, and family-centered care advocate. Remember, these rooms were largely designed not just with our architects um, uh, or the providers, but with significant input from uh, patients and families. Um, and this uh, advisor, this organization helped save my son's life. I feel honored and proud to participate in this profound time in our organization's history. And uh, on the nursing side, we've been opening up curtains and windows now that our patients aren't sharing rooms. They've never experienced this before, and it's incredible. So um, you all uh, helped us do this process helped us do this, uh, and I'm incredibly proud that uh, our organization was able to deliver on this complex project. Um, and, you know, back to sort of the, uh, how these projects can be done with great transparency uh, and get to a good result, uh, we set up a, uh, a process where for big projects in the health network, we have a trustee ad hoc oversight committee. We had one for this project. We have one for the EPIC project. We certainly will have one for the inpatient uh, psych project, should you give us a CON for that. And this is the um, spreadsheet that we took to the trustees on that ad hoc committee uh, on a monthly basis. Um, and um, the uh, bottom line, the first number total project cost that you gave us a CON for 187 million. Um, at this point, through May 31st, which uh, is essentially complete, we're at uh, uh, essentially 180 million. So this project came in um, like we love to see them uh, on time and uh, under budget. Uh, and there might be a few contingency things that as we really uh, uh, get used to the building that we'll have to uh, continue to use. But uh, certainly it's, uh, it's not going to be uh, over budget. Um, we also, uh, the other huge investment uh, that we're making that you've helped us with um, uh, is the EPIC project. And I'm certainly not going to take you through this. I put it up there just to tell you um, the complexity of this and to remind you that on November 1st, uh, wave one will go live and that will be uh, everything epic at the UVM Medical Center. Inpatient, outpatient, ambulatory, business, revenue cycle, the whole enchilada. There's some. Uh, uh, key clinical areas that we didn't implement EPIC in 2008-2009 that will go live. So this is everything uh, EPIC. We'll also include in this wave one, so going live November 1st, the physician ambulatory practices at Central Vermont, at Porter, and at um, Champlain Valley in Plattsburgh. So our physicians and uh, other clinicians at the ambulatory level are going to be on the same record. So if you're seen at Centre Vermont in one of the primary care practices, down the highway, up the highway to uh, a specialist at the medical center in Burlington, same record. Okay, that, that's coming November 1st. Um, this is a monumental undertaking. And the sort of bringing this online in close proximity to the um, uh, Miller opening at the medical center is um, 
uh, a stressor on our people. And, you know, I'll take some ownership uh, for those being uh, close together. Uh, maybe we didn't put in the right amount of planning time and whatnot. But this is going to be a success, just like the, uh, uh, the Miller building. Um, about um, nine or ten months after November 1st, the inpatient uh, and rest of the business processes at Center Vermont and Porter go live. And then about um, uh, 11 or 12 months after that go live, the rest of the inpatient and uh, business at Champlain Valley goes live. Um, and so this is set up, as you remember, from the CON to uh, roll out uh, and to minimize the expense, the expense largely being driven by the number of outside folks that we need to bring in to help us during the implementation, uh, in, uh, implementation phase. So uh, doing this as one project, but uh, in sequence with some uh, overlap was the best way to minimize the implementation risk uh, and at the same time uh, minimize the, uh, the expense. So um, uh, mounting excitement, anxiety um, uh, around this, my view is that the anxiety and tension is around the right level. If there was none, I'd be really, really worried that we were going to uh, not do this well. Um, but I don't think that we're in a place where the anxiety is paralytic. People are really uh, doing the work to get this done. At the same time, we're also implementing some other systems that are uh, in the critical path of this. Um, you know, we've put in um, the Axiom Cost Accounting and Budgeting uh, system. Um, we're moving towards putting Premier Connect in, which uh, greatly dovetails with this. It's a consistent GL and supply chain. Um, and um, uh, on the HR side, uh, we're putting in Workday. It's in, in the medical center. It's going in in order and central lot as we speak. And having that implemented as a prerequisite to turning on uh, Epic and getting off of Meditech, because Meditech has the payroll system for those two organizations. So we can't just turn that off uh, unless we have a work day or something else to, to do payroll and the other reach approaches. So um, some things looking forward, um, just some examples of ongoing uh, work um, that I'd like to share uh, or uh, brag about. Um, uh, high value care really is achieving the triple aim, but think about it at the individual level. It's, max, it's um, uh, me providing the absolute best patient experience. Um, getting the best outcome for that individual and doing it as efficiently as possible. And, you know, we have some examples of how we would uh, uh, and are doing that. But uh, wonderful primary care doc, uh, Natasha uh, Winters, uh, Withers, I'm sorry, in, uh, uh, in Addison County, and she's actually doing follow-ups um, uh, on FaceTime, an iPad, with those that um, have chronic conditions and great difficulty uh, getting into her office, particularly during times when the, uh, the weather's lousy. And, you know, that is um, uh, providing the service when the patient needs it and wants it. It's uh, as efficient as it gets if you look at the total, um, uh, a total view of efficiency and not just uh, the charges. Um, and um, the patients love it. You know, you gotta go into that and say, you know, maybe somebody um, would wanna, you know, get all dressed up and head out to the doctor. I don't know, it's kind of an outing, but, um, uh, being able to deliver this kind of service um, 
uh, has been a, a, a real pleaser. Um, sort of in the same vein with home health and hospice, we've done a couple of things. They had this, you know, uh, and I'll forget the exact timing, but um, uh, after uh, an admission, um, uh, you get uh, home health reimbursement uh, from Medicare, particularly on a set, I think it's 60 days. And for many of those patients who our home health and hospice are following, during that 45 or 60 days, they have home health monitoring. They got a scale, got a blood pressure cuff, they have a pulse oximeter that tells us uh, what their oxygen levels are. And there's a nurse that calls them at a set time every day or every other day, depending upon their condition, and they just read off what they've, uh, uh, what their, uh, their measures are. And, um, you know, you can tell if somebody's going off the rails, call the primary care doc, and so there's a, a connection function there. We've added that same FaceTime feature to the monitors uh, that uh, we've purchased for home health uh, and hospice. And, um, uh, we thought, you know, it's not expensive to have those, that monitoring equipment. It's actually, you know, about 15 minutes in an emergency room anywhere in uh, the state would totally eclipse what it costs to have that equipment there. And so we said, what the heck, we'll just keep the equipment in the uh, patient's home. We won't call them as frequently, but after a couple of months, they're well trained that if something is going uh, off the uh, rails that they know to call in and give them a call in number. Maybe we'll check in with them monthly. It's been a hugely successful pilot program and looks like it really um, uh, is very, very useful in reducing uh, readmissions uh, and keeping people in the home where they want to be. Um, one other example, and I know that Dr. Steve Leffler, I think, talked to you about this at the, um, uh, the session that uh, you all uh, arranged, um, uh, the uh, protocol for chest pain in the emergency rooms. I mean, that's a, just a classic example of how you work together, high-value care, and, you know, if you're counting on fee-for-service for every single admission, although this would be the right thing to do from a moral, ethical mission perspective, it would be a dumb thing to do from a business perspective. But, um, you know, the admissions for chest pain using a standardized protocol have diminished to about a third of what they were before, and there's still more room to go down at the individual provider level. So you can just, particularly with the EPIC implementation and the ability to really, almost with a keystroke, look at variations in these types of care, um, you can see more and more and more of those. And they really relate to um, just the tip of the spear when you bring together the new reimbursements and uh, what we're trying to do with population health. Um, Workforce. We touched on this uh, a little bit, um, and um, we have been, as a uh, as an organization, supporting for a couple of years the Vermont Business Roundtable in an effort to bring a national program here local. It's uh, around uh, developing the talent pipeline, and they actually do it in different business sectors, and uh, we're supporting the program. Uh, globally, uh, but one of the sectors is healthcare, and it's really all about going out to the businesses in that sector, understand what they really need for the workforce, and then going out to the educational system at various levels and bringing those needs, wants, and desires together with those that can actually deliver them. Uh, the, the training in the workforce. So it's um, actually most developed uh, in the construction industry for the uh, talent pipeline here in Vermont, um, but there's been great work on the healthcare side uh, as well. So sort of top of the box where we're 
that uh, we're working on. Um, Centre Vermont uh, has launched some uh, innovative programs, uh, both with uh, LNA, uh, licensed nursing assistants, and uh, something uh, called the Clinical Care Associate. It's actually a new uh, type of position, somebody that would put a patient from the waiting room uh, uh, into an exam room, uh, take their blood pressure, their vital signs, and take some uh, early information. And the approach that uh, Centre Vermont has taken is there are people out there that are stuck in uh, relatively low paying jobs without a path forward that just can't take 10 weeks or three months, stop life, and just come over and do a training program. So. Uh, and this is so simple, I thought it was uh, brilliant, certainly not my idea, but um, we're paying those folks right from the get-go. We're paying them the same that they're going to pay, be paid at entry level as an LNA uh, or a clinical care associate while they do the training with the proviso that they stay on for a period of time after. So I, that's really a way to grow our own and to work with um, uh, BTC and CCV uh, in that, and also um, working with those organizations to improve the, uh, the, the talent uh, pipeline in nursing. Um, another great one, Kate Fitzpatrick, who's the Chief Nursing Officer at uh, UVM Medical Center, for the last 18 months has uh, worked uh, with uh, uh, institutions of higher education on providing a pathway for <coughs> nurses that are RNs to get their bachelors and do it for free, um, essentially on the time of the medical center. And in 18 months, she's had 112 nurses accept that program and get their bachelors, which greatly takes the uh, skill of the workforce up and uh, you know decreases the pressure on those with, uh, with higher degrees. Um, on the uh, physician side, you know we're working with the College of Medicine. In March, we launched um, in uh, uh, Central Vermont the longitudinal integrated curriculum for third-year medical students. We piloted this in Northern New York, uh, starting uh, a couple of years ago. And it takes a third year student <clears throat> that normally would do six weeks of OBGYN, 10 weeks of family medicine, you know, and do their clinical rotations uh, sort of segmented like that, and drops them for a year in a primary care setting. And they get all of those experiences by following patients that come through that primary care conduit incredibly unique and innovative program. The Northwest is really the only other place that's, uh, that's done that. And we believe that that's gonna be a feeder to our rural primary care residency programs and that that's gonna help us uh, keep those uh, youngsters local. And you know that in Northern New York, we started a family medicine residency uh, out of the starting blocks, graduating uh, for a residency year. The first group uh, graduates, uh, actually graduated either yesterday or today, and three of the four are staying uh, in the FQHC that serves uh, our region in northern New York. Um, and um, uh, this week, uh, our first core of emergency medicine uh, physician, uh, residents are starting. They have uh, rotations at the Medical Center in Burlington, at um, Centre Vermont and at Champlain Valley, so they'll get experience in what it's like uh, in a uh, academic medical center in a, a rural environment. So, growing our own. Um, and the last uh, area to just chat about, and then uh, happy to answer any questions, um, is around the all-payer model. You know that we are totally in on that. And you just have to know that a lot of my 
personal time allocation is going not only to just continuing to uh, get uh, very granular with one care, do everything I can, we can as organizations to make that work. Um, actually, in northern New York, there is, through the Department of Health in New York, um, uh, a similar project that's moving down the tracks, North Country Innovation Pilot, um, that um, is uh, going back and forth with CMMI to see if in that rural environment there isn't a pathway to a total cost of care uh, model. So um, we still uh, believe that there's work to do on growing scale. Um, uh, uh, Chair Mullen was on the, uh, uh, the panel with Don George and myself and Kevin Stone uh, last Thursday for the Vermont Business Roundtable. And I think there's a good story to tell that One Care and Blue Cross Blue Shield are really coming together around um, uh, bringing a, uh, a program forward for those employers that are self-insured to be able to um, uh, really bring value there and grow the attribution. So I think that's uh, very positive. And I think uh, we're working with the last couple of organizations that aren't part of the Medicaid program. And we think we can make progress there. Um, Medicare uh, is an issue and we've had conversations about that. I think you know our approach would be get everybody but Medicare in and make it clear that there are things about the Medicare program that if we could adjust, we could uh, have the same sort of attribution built there, but we'll see how it goes. And then the last area is in regulatory uh, alignment. I've mentioned several of those areas that we can align uh, our processes and efforts as we, uh, uh, as we go through. Um, I would make one other comment that there are uh, uh, DSR funds that there's potential to capture. I realize how difficult it is to bring state dollars forward to um, uh, draw down those federal dollars, but uh, I believe that it's 20 and 21 are our last two chances to take a bite at that federal apple and um, uh, certainly wouldn't want to leave federal dollars on the table uh, if at all possible. And I think that there's ways that um, we might use those dollars in uh, uh, ways to begin tackling what I think is one of the most difficult uh, issues uh, still facing us in making this model work, and that's developing reserves. And um, I understand where those reserves live is an issue, how those reserves are generated. I will tell you that our latest, uh, uh, latest thinking on that is that you have to stay true to the general principle that where the risk resides, that's where you have to have the reserves to mitigate those risks. So there may be some risks that reside collectively at the ACO level, so that there should be reserves there. And we already know that, and I think for next year, we need to have $10 million uh, of reserves at one care. We had four and a half or something this year. But there also are risks that are specific to the balance sheet of hospitals, and we don't need any more Springfields. So we need to be very thoughtful about where the risk resides, and if we can come to the principle of where the risk is, that's where the reserves need to be. Uh, I think we can uh, we can work through that, figure that out. Sorry, I uh, flapped going so much, but I'm happy to answer those questions. Oh, perfect. Questions. And, you know, you really keyed on some very important points. And so um, I'll start off with the questions, uh, Dr. Brumston. You know, you you laid out some great strategies um, that you're utilizing to grow your own and workforce. But uh, just my question for you is, what is the hardest area for you to recruit and retain for today? And given everything that um, you're working on as far as strategies, what do you envision the hardest areas to recruit and retain for in the 
in the future? Um, you know, uh, it varies a bit site uh, by site. Um, uh, I still uh, believe that um, uh, the most difficult um, are, uh, are uh, clinicians and technicians that are patient facing. Um, uh, it's where we should have a leg up as an academic medical center and an academic uh, integrated delivery system that we can find ways uh, to uh, train our own and hopefully train enough so that we can serve uh, others in the region uh, outside. But I think um, it shifts over time as well. It's, you know, we see these national phenomena where, you know, there's a nurse shortage, and it's a crisis, and everybody jumps to, and it seems to get better for a while, and then it's, you know, nobody has uh, anybody at the entry level, and so, um, you know, uh, Center for Law increases the pay for LNAs um, because literally they're all going to work for fast food chains, um, and it raises it a couple bucks an hour, and so we fill that gap. Now Woodridge uh, seems to be fully staffed for a while. So I think it's a moving target. You know, more globally, uh, and uh, we do have people thoughtfully working on this, um, we have to do everything we can to be attractive, not just jump job to job. We have to recognize who we're trying to recruit, we have to pay attention to the, um, what the hotspots in our various organizations are telling us about uh, tensions or burnout or things that, you know, our own employees are telling us are problematic. And so we have to fix uh, those things, I think more uh, flexible hours, um, you know, uh, my stepkids, uh, friends, you know, work for Google or work for big software firms in uh, Boston or big corporations, and they have uh, they have gyms, they have uh, you know free lunches. They I mean so competing for that stuff and not for profit healthcare. We can't go crazy, but we need to pay attention much more, I believe, to the work environment globally um, while we're doing these you know training uh, training our own. You spoke about the uh, Family Medicine Residency Program in upstate New York, and I, and I know you know that uh, one of the hospitals in Southern Vermont is trying to uh, create a model to do similar things. What, what do you think of those efforts? I think it's, uh, uh, it's a great idea. Um, Tom D., uh, when uh, uh, his uh, prior organization, he actually did uh, start uh, a family medicine residency. Uh, talked to Tom about it and uh, offered any help that uh, we can give. Uh, lessons learned. It's incredibly busy. I know this is a surprise, but it's incredibly Byzantine and arcane how um, uh, residency programs are funded through Medicare and essentially no funding unless you're in very specific um, uh, areas largely in, in primary care. And I think they're trying to wend their way through that. So we've offered uh, help, but uh, I'm sure uh, Tom D can get it done if it's doable. And do you think they'll be successful in actually keeping some of those students? I, um, the statistics are impossible to escape at um, how close to one's training, uh, the vast majority of people end up practicing. It's a formative time in people's lives, and so if there's an opportunity, it's just almost seamless and comfortable to uh, move into uh, those roles. And it goes all the way, it's uh, most demonstrable in primary care practices. Uh, my wonderful daughter-in-law is 
finishing her uh, fellowship in pulmonary critical care at the medical center, and she's accepted a, a job there. So it goes all the way to uh, the specialty level uh, as well. It, it really, um, it's a great way. Emergency medicine, we have around the state uh, significant expense from uh, outside firms uh, uh, supplying the human resources for emergency rooms and some local tenants, not just in northern New York, but in Vermont. And so bringing uh, good emergency medicine docs uh, into the environment, I think, actually uh, are going to be consi uh, considerable cost saver going, going forward. Any questions from the board? Thank you for this presentation. It's, uh, um, it's always nice to have a conversation rather than you know, when, when there's a time that something's really at stake, uh, just to, to share ideas. One of the things that um, I'm growing more and more concerned as I, um, as I move forward here is the um, uh, impact of the cost shift and demographics. Um, you mentioned both. Um, and I think that those are powerful forces in our, our healthcare financing scenario, and they affect hospitals or hospital service areas differentially. Um, you know, I'll just make a note here and connect the dots loosely, very loosely. Um, but you re reference population growth, which is happening in Chittenden County. Um, certainly, it's a younger population in Chittenden County. Um, there's a higher uh, income relative to uh, other counties, and so the wind is a bit relatively at your back. Um, and I, I worry that that uh, uh, gets embedded um, as we transition to a fixed prospective payment uh, system. Um, you know, uh, UVM Hospital has uh, got a 4.6% advantage over other Vermont hospitals in terms of commercial payers. Um, it's uh, slightly less in terms of medi me the Medicaid payers and 4% less in terms of Medicare payers. So um, so here's where the dots get connected loosely. Um, I'm going back to the enforcement period uh, that we just went through. And <clears throat> UVM uh, had a $46.1 million operating margin and collectively um, the rest of the hospitals were in the red. Uh, there were eight that were deeply in the red. And um, kind of looking at total margin, uh, um, UVM accrued uh, over 75% of the total margin among all the hospitals. So I'm just wondering, um, sometimes I wish that in our Medicaid program we had something like FMAP, where at the federal level, Medicaid is distributed based on uh, factors in, in the formula that weigh these underlying economic demographic uh, considerations and that whereas in, at Vermont procedure prices are set and uh, they apply to everyone pretty much across the board and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about um, how the playing field can be leveled as we move forward uh, in the all-payer model um, as opposed to um, uh, kind of embedding those uh, um, differences uh, through the actuarial work, actuarial work that we do um, going forward. A um, couple of thoughts. Um, if you go back to work by the Green Mountain Care Board uh, that you chartered, and even back further to work that Anya Rader Wallach did when her consulting firm, you'll see that for most of the uh, sectors of healthcare delivery um, that the academic medical center in Vermont is the least expensive. Particularly if you go to the procedure level um, or anything that uh, borders on complex. And so um, uh, you have to be careful of what you ask for, because if you really did that leveling on a bundled payment, if you did that leveling on sort of bundling um, episodes of care, 
um, you will um, almost certainly, it's a bit of an untested hypothesis, um, drive the smaller hospitals where the cost of providing those services uh, is higher out of business. Now there may be, um, you know, as I think forward in the all-payer model, and if you're really sitting at one care with your fiduciary hat on, and you're taking a total payment for a population, at some point, and I believe in the not too distant future, one care is going to have to say, globally, we all the reimbursements here, we're going to only be able to pay X for this service, and it has to meet this quality measure. And if you can do that, cost and quality, and you can provide the access, go for it. That's going to, uh, I think, um, force some of the issues around distribution of services, and that's really where the rubber meets the road, going from fee-for-service with a little bit of capitation to really the delivery system, or a big chunk of it, taking accountability for the use of X amount uh, of resource. So, um, and um, preparing for that, um, the best way to do that is to take our current organizations and up front decide where you're going to do what, what's most efficient, where you can provide the highest quality, balancing that with how far somebody has to drive for a service. So we're preparing for that we being the UVM Health Network. Good question. Other questions? Jess? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, lots of helpful information in there and a lot of promise, I think. Um, relative to some of the workforce issues that you raised, which I think are very important and something we should all be thinking about, access is obviously an issue in terms of, you know, we're seeing some weight patterns on specialty care. And I'm wondering, in your view, what you see the role of technology in alleviating some of that. And in particular, your example of the FaceTime feature struck me as less interesting, um, you know, with access, including access, <coughs> maybe making a provider time more efficient, perhaps. I don't know if that is or is not. Increasing access, I don't know. Telemedicine. I also was thinking even just about Epic, now that you have Epic, uh, or November 1st, you'll have Epic, um, with the, you know, the primary care practices at, at UVM, I mean, at uh, CVMC and Porter, also with the, the network. Um, does that help with scheduling or referrals, streamlining that process? And I'm just wondering, what is the role for technology versus just hiring more providers? How so, can we use technology? It's a great question. Um, particularly in rural environments, telemedicine uh, is uh, important um, uh, we're actually uh, piloting with uh, senior housing, um, having the caregiver there be able to bring to a telemedicine unit uh, individuals and have their primary care uh, visit uh, that way. When you, as long as you set up telemedicine consistent with the other schedules, you don't have somebody that's trying to see a full day of clinical activity and oh by the way the phone rang so they got to run down um, it can be um, uh, a real um, uh, enhancement um, call center technology um, and queuing theory uh, comes to the last bastion of uh, medicine you know um, uh, there's a whole science to how you can call Delta and book your flight and uh, not wait and get moved right through. Um, we're in the process of implementing a uh, call center that's um, very uh, tech dependent and also um, 
uh, very uh, specific in how you set up the protocol. So we actually have brought a consultant in by the name of Chartis, and we expect uh, by the end of this calendar year that a significant portion of the faculty practice in Burlington will have their schedules done uh, through just one call, which um, dramatically increases productivity. It's difficult to get professionals to give up their uh, control of their schedule, but once you get over that, um, again, everybody that's gone down that road really has been a crowd pleaser. The one that, um, uh, by the data, will be most impactful of what I see, and it's directly related to your question about EPIC, is uh, the American Association of Medical Colleges, AAMC, has launched a collaborative uh, project um, that um, I think has gone through the three or four phases of organizations coming in, and it's around developing the protocols and the processes to do e-consults. So I'm a primary care doc. I need. I, have somebody who I really think needs to see a pulmonologist because they have shortness of breath, chronic cough, and and so for shortness of breath and chronic cough, the pulmonologists have developed a consult form what they need to know. Double AMC is working on with all of these providers. How can you have a primary care doctor take five minutes or less to point and click that form? send it off to the uh, pulmonologist. Um, the pulmonologist can spend anywhere from five minutes to 20 or 30 minutes, depending upon the complexity, if they have to go look at images and stuff like that. But there's a big portion that they can just send back to the primary care doc, do X, Y, and Z. This is what I think it is. Go forth and prosper. And so that interchange um, around the patient, taking care of the specifics, dramatically improves access. And that's, you know, been shown in the early rollout. Dartmouth is down the road on this a little bit, and they've had phenomenal results. We are in the next wave, but we've got to get past November 1st. Um, it starts uh, soon in the, uh, in the new year. So um, that holds great uh, promise uh, without just throwing more uh, providers at the that issue. That sounds fantastic. I mean, it's sort of, you can imagine it will reduce costs and improve quality of the two sometimes. Yeah, and, and you know, right now there are the dreaded RVUs associated with that uh, activity. Um, and you know, in a fee-for-service world, you can get paid for that activity, of course, we would uh, want that for everybody that uh, is under a, a global payment uh, because you know, we want that to be best for them. We want to be absolutely efficient with our provider's time. And I've said this a lot. I mean, it's been a couple of years since I've practiced. But if I went and did a half-day session and saw 15 patients, if five of them traveling from all over our region really needed my expertise and my experience, it was a great session. The other 10, I could have answered with a phone call or they could have, with a little prompting, seen their local OBGYN and gotten just as good uh, uh, service. And so this cuts through all of that. I'm anxious to hear the outcome on that one. That sounds great. Um, my last point, my last question is around your points about population growth and the changing in acuity are really important. And to the extent we need to be thinking about that when we do hospital budgeting, we definitely, I appreciate that you brought that to the forefront there. We are, I think, maybe aware, we're trying to do a little self-study ourselves on regulatory alignment. And in that, we're trying to think about how do we align our processes, our hospital budget process, our ACO process, our insurance rate review process, all of that to think about how does it align with other, it has a line with the goals of the all payer model. So, I thought your chart on uh, the risk adjusted cost per unit patient was incredibly helpful. So, I guess I would throw out there I would love to hear, and I probably, it may, this may be 
hope a future conversation with Professor Stanislaus, I'm not sure. Uh, but the methodology behind making those calculations and the ease with which other hospitals who don't have the same IT software support cost accounting systems that the network has would be able to make those same calculations. So I recognize that maybe that's a long question and it's probably a, for another time and maybe a phone a friend yeah. for question. And I think it would, uh, uh, I believe this is started to a certain extent, but it would be great to have Green Mountain Care Board staff and um, finance folks from uh, around uh, Vermont, all of the hospitals and probably the FQHCs, um, just uh, understanding is pretty uh, basic if we moved to uh, that kind of metric. We all should agree on the, the methodology. And um, I would think that most of the hospitals would be able to come up with the um, the uh, variables in calculating that. Everybody tracks CMI, everybody tracks uh, net patient service revenue. Uh, it's a matter of really the denominator and figuring out how you define a unique patient. Do you agree with that, Mark? Yes. Thank so, yeah. uh, future Thank conversation. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Now we can open it up to the public for public comment. Ken. Yes, uh, listening to the presentation, I thought it was a very good presentation, uh, it made me think of my coach in college. Um, we had a very good team for a number of years, and every time we won, he'd come in and he'd say, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. <laughs> And I thought he made this up, and I was really impressed with it. It turns out I think it was Shakespeare who said it. That's another story. But the, the, the issue is that I think it's, uh, you know, brief analysis to say, and, and listening to the presentation, that the UVM Medical Network wears the crown in Vermont in terms of health care. It's obviously a service leader. It's an incredible economic engine. Um, with amazingly strong financial record of the last five or six years. I'd call it bountiful, um, and perhaps even have been critical of, of the bounty. It's definitely an employment center, and um, it, the UVM Medical Network is a very powerful political force. And in turn, it creates uh, an interesting vacuum because it, it provides great negotiating power. It's certainly a staffing workforce magnet that attracts people for, for some very good reasons. And it's increasingly, and again, the, the presentation of the opening of new units increasingly becomes what we'd call the place to go when one needs health care, particularly more intensive health care. The, the question that I have is, and it, it sort of relates to the panel of, I don't know, a month ago or a few weeks ago, you know, about the lamenting what, do we, what to do about the smaller hospitals in Vermont, um, and everybody was wringing their hands. I was actually amazed that nobody on the panel offered the suggestion that I'll offer is that the very power and dominance of the UVM Medical Center is one of the reasons that many of the small hospitals are in jeopardy. Uh, they simply can't compete in this environment. And it's not necessarily to criticize UVM Network for being very successful, um, although it does beg the question, is there a responsibility that the network has to help some of these smaller hospitals that are increasingly, I think, going to have trouble competing? So that's the essence of my question. Um, is it possible that the very bigger of the UVM medical network is one of the reasons that increasingly it appears that small hospitals, which really is everybody else but the university network, um, seem to be potentially in distress? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I've been part of the UVM 
Medical Center and its progenitor organizations since 1981. And from the time that I actually got my head up and recognized where I was and what was going on, which was definitely a few years after 1981, I've always been struck um, at the posture of the Academic Medical Center being a very big fish in a small pond. Um, working hard to not take advantage of that, to not replicate what happened with partners in Massachusetts. Um, and, um, you know, this is a, uh, a, an issue that I certainly uh, would not expect uh, anybody to just take face value uh, from me. I'm obviously uh, biased, but if you went back and objectively looked at the track record and the reach out that the resources of the academic medical center from the MCHV days, how those resources have been allocated to support other organizations. Um, I think you'll find that at least nine times out of 10, the academic medical center was um, functioning uh, with, in a very magnanimous way. Supporting the blueprint, all in, totally all in, all in it for support uh, of uh, primary care. Putting tens of millions of dollars into the formation of um, the ACO. In a sea of um, large academic medical centers around the country being in a very small group that really have not just been willing to sort of go towards a change in reimbursement, but going uh, all in. And those are just, you know, off the top of my head, sharing clinicians, having clinicians, oncologists go up to Morrisville and do an oncology uh, clinic, even though much more efficient to stay uh, in the big office in, in Burlington. I think if you really, anybody, again, don't take it from me, but objectively went through how this organization has functioned over time. A couple of flips along the way, I'll admit, but if you looked at how that organization, our organization has functioned over time, You'd be hard pressed to put it in the evil empire uh, category, I think. Other public comment? Walter. Just wanted to pick up on a comment that Robin made earlier about affording assurance in that no one can afford insurance now, never mind in the future, because of the system's inability to keep costs under control, even though we're trying hard, but our wages don't go up every time we see another figure on the board here about 6% or whatever increase. I just wanted to thank Robin for that comment, because we can barely afford it now. We can afford it, really. <laughs> Other public comment? None. I, I want to thank you, Dr. Brumstead, and uh, uh, we'll see you again, in, I guess, in a couple of months. Thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for uh, being a transformational leader. Sometimes it's very easy to uh, fall into keeping the, the status quo in, in leadership, and uh, I've always believed that organizations have to grow or die, and I'm not saying that you have to, to expand some of that, but you have to continually innovate and uh, challenge yourself. And, I think you continue to do that. I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved.
It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of this glorious uh,